Okay, so last time we ended up uh, with this application. So this is our uh, React app as it is now. We have our homepage here, rendering. Uh, this is the, the module that you see here. There's another one here, the address bar, and there's a Google results here. Really nice. And we can press next step, and that will move us one step down. If we do that again, we get to the evaluation step. And then if we do that down, we get to the next module. So we have that going for us. Also, we already have our Node.js backend, which should be here. So this actually goes and fetches out the modules. So this fetches out to the server. You can actually see this request if we open it in another tab. And so React actually stores that information uh, as the component is rendering um, through componented mount. And that we'll see in the um, module list class here. So in this function, we actually load the module. We check if there's an active module ID that's available for us. So if we have actual modules in that list. And then we set the state. So we have our modules here. Um, and we have our loading indicator, so if we comment this out and we save, our app should refresh, and there it goes. And now we should just see the loading indicator here, because we don't actually have any data there. And that's also what will happen while it's loading if your server takes longer time than this. Cool. So let's go back, save this. What we don't have right now is we don't actually have our... Um, actual thing doesn't actually save to a database. Instead what it does is it just has this in-memory controller that has these modules and it will work from there. Now that's not ideal of course because we want to be able to use um, our database MongoDB to actually store this information. And for that we need to have a little bit, we have to do a little bit of extra work here. Um, what we want to do is we want to use this library called Mongoose and that will connect to MongoDB for us. I actually have to find the right one, I think this one. Um, and that will connect to our database, it will load the model, we will specify a model here, and then we will um, be able to get the list of modules here. I haven't worked with this yet, so this will be a learning exercise for me as well, and I'm not going to look at the other code, so I'm just going to try to figure it out together with you guys. So this is the data that I want, and I want to be able to store that in the database here. So I know I'm going to use um, Mongoose for that. So the first thing that I need from the terminal here, um, this is my server running, is to run npm install with Mongoose. That's our library, that's what we're going to need. The other library that we're going to need is called .env. And you've probably already seen this, but this module is used to store our environment variables here. And all it does is it gives us a nice place to store this information, because if we don't have this, then we have to hard code it into our server application, like in the controller.js, and that would be pretty nasty, so don't want to do that. So instead we're also going to install .env, and .env will actually store that information inside of a .env, .env file, and that's the one we see here. Um, we know our connection string for MongoDB, that's um, the MongoDB URI, and that's what Mongoose is actually using. So that's this string, basically, we want to get that out. So let's do that step by step. Let's try to connect to the database first and see if that works. So in server here, we're going to make a .env file. We're going to touch that file, go back to Sublime, and here find that AMV file. And we're going to create an environment variable called MongoDB URI. And it's going to look something like this. So MongoDB localhost. And then the app is going to be called Hubble app for us. So that should be enough. That means that when we're uh, loading our app, so in index.js, so this is when the app first loads, we actually want to do what we see here in .env, and this looks pretty simple. We're just going to copy and paste that code. That will configure um, our environment variable for it. And then we can actually have process.env to be able to connect to that database. Let's try that out. So 
we're going to also include mongoose here and requiring in our .env and then uh, let's say here after our modules we're going to try to connect to our database here now react stores this information in process .env, so that's what we're actually going to use and then after that comes the name of whatever it is that we saved so we call our thing mongodb uri so that's the uh, oops that's the thing that we want to have save here so process.env.mongodb uri and that should probably connect to our database if it doesn't we probably run into some issues so let's try running that server and seeing what happens current URL stringer is deprecated and will be removed in a future version to use a new parser pass option use the okay whatever uh, it says it's running let's try introducing an, an error here let's try changing that to um, all cat host and seeing if that runs okay and now we get a lot of failure here because it's trying to connect to a database that doesn't exist so this tells us that we're actually connecting to our database we're not doing anything with it yet but we have this connection already going which is nice so now we should be able to specify our um, let's actually try to pass this into mongoose because mongoose is actually using the mongo client um, uh, beneath the scene so we're, we don't actually directly connect there but maybe we can pass this argument anyway um, so that will you know pin that afterwards see if that actually works uh, okay and we also do npm start here to have no daemon run for us so we don't have to do it by hand yeah, cool and it seems that it works so having that use neural you parser here works now I don't really concern why they should be here or what that actually means it's just something that I took up here I haven't read in any documentation about that okay so we should be able to specify our model model now and that should probably be loaded in our controller here and we should think about it we we can actually add it here first and then we can figure out if that's the right place where it should go it's not it's not the right place but <laughs> whatever so we're we'll move that in a minute we'll refactor that so our model is going to be a mongoose.model and we're going to require mongoose in this module as well mongoose and uh, the model is going to be called model it's kind of a confusing name because uh, this is actually sorry it's not a model it's module that's the one we want to connect and I'm now sort of assuming that mongoose will map this to slash modules although I'm not really sure that it does this uh, but we'll have to figure it out where it's going to store that thing and a model has or a module sorry has a title which is a string it has an explanation which is also a string and we can copy and paste that and it has an exercise which also a string and evaluation which is also a string easy so that's our module 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 I'm sorry I'm going to make this mistake a couple of times so that means that now we should be able to save a module in our database and we should be able to see that as a collection of I'm assuming modules plural um, cool so I'm thinking what the best way is to progress because I of course I can make one here but I don't want to do that over and over again instead I really want to um, actually want a function or a script that sort of loads this dummy data in for me so that I have something that I can work with um, so let's try making that available if that makes sense um, so in my server here I'm going to make a script I'm sorry so I'll show you on the command line so in the server folder which is here 
I'm going to make a folder script and then in that folder script I'm going to say touch uh, like load dummy data. We're going to change that to a executable thing. That's going to be a Node.js um, thing. Um, and let's see if I can find that. So that's this thing here. And that's going to pick up a part of this uh, information here. So it's going to load Mongoose. It's going to require the .env thing. It's going to connect to Mongoose here. And then it will also require um, the uh, modules. And then the one we don't have yet, which is our uh, model here. So the model.js. So that will store the model, the mongoose model for module. Okay, that's confusing enough. So um, out of here comes probably right now a module. This might not, yeah, it's probably going to be a good idea to do it this way. And this will be a JavaScript file that will load um, Node.js. So can we find out where Node.js is? Which node? Okay, so in my case, that's user local bin node. Um, I might also do, which is even better, user bin env node. And that will use node to execute that. Let's set the syntax highlighting to JavaScript. Um, cool. We don't have that module thing here. We actually need it in our modules file. So I wanted to wait with that for a little while, but let's do it immediately. So this is our model. So we have our controller, we have our model, and the model is going to contain how the data looks. This is basically this, file, this piece of code here. Right. And then we have this other thing, which is this information thing here. And that's our dummy data, right? That's what we are going to store. Um, so we are going to copy it. I'm still leaving it in here because otherwise we might get errors here. Um, so we'll leave our controller as is. In our model.js, we're going to say, well, um, we want to export here. So same as in our controller where we export the get modules function in our model.js, we're going to do module exports equals module. <coughs> I know, excuse me, I know the names are confusing, but that's the way we should set it up, I think. Um, and then later in our controller, we're going to load our module from here. We can actually do that already. It's require model. And then I'm not sure if we actually need mongoose. Let's leave it for now there. But, um, okay, and then the load dummy data thing. It's going to load that module thing from um, the model. And then it's going to create these new things for us, right? So here we have to look at the API for mongoose. So here we can say, um, const uh, let's look a little bit here so we have our first module which is our home page module equals um, new module and we're going to specify these three things right so our ID is going to be generated by mongoose we don't have any control over that we have our explanation exercise evaluation all of these things will appear here Right, so that should do it, I think. And let's not save that right now. Let's see if we can actually print out the title, for example. Let's see if that does anything. So we're in our scripts folder, so we want to do this script slow dummy data. Right, and now it says mongoose is not defined. Which is kind of annoying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see if we can do it like this. Okay, let's try with npm run here. So um, 
in our package.json let's actually make a load dummy data thing here that runs scripts uh, load dummy data let's use load for that add a comma here and now we can do npm run load dummy data and that should set up our, all of our packages here and as you can see it doesn't so we probably have some other issue okay and that's because we we are using mongoose here but we're not importing that so that's wrong of course um let's find our model and you know that i'm jumping around a little, bit, a little bit between all of these files and that sort of okay so it prints home page that's cool because that's the um, thing we want to see it doesn't finish though it doesn't finish running which is kind of weird because i thought it would actually do that okay and also it doesn't save anything right because um yeah, that's not implemented yet um so let's try that now let's try doing home page module dot save <clears throat> and that should save the home page module in our database. Let's take a look. So it says home page. It doesn't finish for some reason. But now if we do Mongo, um, yeah, we say use hobo app, which is the name, show collections. You see it says modules here. So it has automatically translated the word module two plural modules and then also made it lowercase cool so um, my mongodb is a bit rusty here um, can we do like db modules of find or something yeah okay cool so that's that's the thing that's stored here which works cool so it has the idea that's the random id that's generated for us it's not actually random it's based on the uh, timestamp here it has a title, has the home page, and all of that good stuff. Cool. Now, of course, if we do that, if we run that function again, it's going to re-insert uh, all of that data into the database, which is not kind of what we want. So we probably want to make it so that we can delete data from our um, from our system here. Let's see if there's a there's an override thing which we don't want yet. Um, deleting delete many that sounds good and so home page model uh, actually just module so the name this is one module but it's actually the module class let's say it's not really a class I think but it sort of pretends it's going to be a class delete many and then we should specify a filter but we don't so we just leave that open and that means that we're um, yeah we're not waiting for that so we don't have to save anything here uh, we also don't have to print anything we just want to delete everything so run our load dummy data thing again this time we don't get anything back we should probably resolve the promise here um, now if we go look at the um, database here use hobo app db um, modules fine then we get everything that's not cool um, why doesn't this you actually need to do something like this and then function error um, it seems that I actually printed out the error I keep forgetting how to write success here. 
confusing. Cool. So we've tried, we're trying to delete that data. It's a success. Cool. Um, let's see if that actually works. Oh, and now they're empty. So we actually had to specify this empty fielder here. Yeah. This is kind of annoying because there's no documentation. We don't really know that. I just sort of guessed that it probably required a filter, any kind of filter, and has this fail-safe mode where if you don't specify anything, it's going to take the prudent option and not delete anything. So it's going to take, take the, do the safe thing and say, okay, you probably made a mistake here, so I'm not going to delete anything. But by specifying this, it means our filter is empty, so everything will be selected, and so everything will be deleted, which is cool. So that's our first thing that we are going to do. Can we actually use a weight here? Um, I'm not sure if we can. Now we should probably put that in to an async function. Let's see. So, yeah. Okay, so we have to make an async function. Um, run. Because this is our main function, right? This is the thing that actually needs to run. we we'll just call run here. Um, cool. Only it doesn't return, which is kind of annoying. Um, finish. So it's probably going to tell me that it's finished, right? But then it doesn't finish. There's a trick here, which is to call process.exit, but it's probably because I made a mistake here that it's not actually finishing. Now I don't want to figure that out just yet, so I'm going to do the kind of evil option which is to call process exits in Node.js. Just a note that using process exit is not a recommended practice. Yeah. We know. So process exit, not a good idea, but it works. So now if you run it says finished and it actually finishes process. Okay, so now we've deleted all that stuff, this is cool, but we actually want to have this data, of course. So that's what <clears throat> um, we currently have in our thing here. So this, this is our dummy data, right? That's what we want to load here. And now this file will be messed up because we're actually loading things here that don't work. But that's fine, that's what we expect. So we're going to our scripts, load dummy data here, which is going to close this down for a little while so you can see. So we're loading mongoose, we're requiring that in, we're connecting to the database with our MongoDB URI, um, requiring our module here, and now we're actually going to have all of this dummy data inserted here. And now we've deleted everything and now we can do a loop over that dummy data. So now we can say for um, const module of uh, modules, capitals. So it's going to loop over all of that data and it's going to say await um, new module with the information that's stored into module. And then it's also going to save that. Right. That will work, I think. Maybe we can also log module.title just to, to see what we're actually storing here. This is kind of funny because it's now loading the home page, but it's not getting anything back. Um, right. Oh, yeah, because we are passing in our object ID. We shouldn't do this, do this right? Because MongoDB will assign these for us. Before, we didn't have them, uh, but now MongoDB will do that automatically for us. Cool. So now we have these three modules here. If we go check in our database, they should be there. So we are using the Hobo app. DB module is fine, and we actually see all of this data. Nice. Um, cool. So that's our script, right? We have our dummy data now inside of the thing. We don't have to run this script anymore. It's done. So we can close that down. Now we actually want to use, be able to use that data 
from our controller. So we've loaded our module already, which is fine. So now all we have to do here is basically get all the modules. So I think that will be module.find. Um, it's also an async function. We're awaiting uh, for the um, modules to come back. This actually is wrong because this has the same module. Right, there's, it's super confusing because there's model and module. We're finding all of them, I think, but it's probably called, going to be called find all or something. Let's see, so can we see queries? Find one, find, what does find give me back? Why does it change here? Model.find, so it needs conditions. It doesn't actually need conditions, but right. We just basically get everything back, right? So that's what we are doing here. Um, and then we're sending these modules along. Cool. Did that work? Is he happy about that? Let's see. Uh, right. Our await here is wrong because we are awaiting this part, not that part. Let's see. So it says app crashed, and now by refreshing that, it automatically reloads. So cool. We can try here in our browser to see if we can actually get these modules back <clears throat> and see what that does. It seems to work. We actually get these new IDs, not the old ones, but the new ones. We also have this underscore underscore fee, which I'm not sure what that is. Maybe the version. Uh, and then if we go back to our app here. Cool. So we actually see the data here. And this is the, the data we load right from the server. So if we now add a module, well, we have to do the whole process, of course, we, but we can now, um, we have all the parts in place, let's say. So we have the database, we're connecting to the database, that database is connected to the server, and the server is connected to the client. So all of these steps are there, um, and they're all connected to each other. So I'm going to run this True, true. You just to make sure that you have it. So, from the part of uh, our app.js, which is our main entry point, basically into the application. Actually, the index.js in the client is the main entry point into the application. So this is what loads when we load our app here, when we see our browser here. So that's going to render our app component into the root of our document. Cool. And so our app component now. It's just a basic component that renders the module list. That's all it does. So now we have to go look at module list. And there, our render method by default is going to render these modules. And initially, they are going to be empty, which is what we see when we have this loader here. But then the moment that we are loading, our component has mounted, so we're done here, then we're waiting for the module store to actually give us the actual modules back. And this is an async function that will return modules for us. Okay, so now the next step is to figure out what this module store is doing. So we're going to look at module store. It has only one method at the moment, get modules. So this is our API, but then from the client side. And what that does is it's going to fetch from the API URL, it's going to fetch slash modules. So that's the request that we're doing here. Note that this is at the API URL, so port 4000, not port 3000, where our application is running. And that's because we have it set here. So if you don't specify this React app API URL, we're just going to have this 4000 here, slash module. So that's the URL we're fetching. That will give us a re response back. We are going to get the JSON from that, and those are our modules. Cool. So that's the client side. For the server side, what we do here is we also have an index.js, not this one, but this one. What that's going to do is it's going to get everything set up here. It's going to look for a .env file in the server directory, which we have. That's this file. And that file will specify where our database is stored. And note here that we can do some creative approaches here. We, we are, don't want to check in this file so that in when we're deploying, we can actually have a different configuration here. So this is, needs to go in our git ignore. And then we are going to go to our server here. 
we're loading our modules from the controller. So right now that's only this function here. And that's going to be routed here later. So if we do app.get slash modules, then that's going to call that function here. This is going to connect to our database. We're setting up express. We have our dummy request here. So that's just the, this one, not very special. Um, then we have slash modules, and that will actually go to our controller, and that will um, do get modules. Now this is an async function, so it doesn't come back immediately. Instead, it's going to wait for module.find to come back. And what's module.find? Well, module is actually defined in the model.js for that model. So here it's important to note that we have our responsibilities together. So we have modules and that has a controller and a model set together. So these are all the parts that are related to modules um, in the way that we have. So if we we're going to do learning pods as well, we also want to have a folder called learning pods here that also is going to have a controller and it's also going to have a model. So the model here is just a very simple mongoose model that automatically resolves to modules lowercase and that will have a title explanation exercise and evaluation and that sort of creates something that is a clause so we can call new on it which is what we do in our load dummy data uh, but it also specifies some other methods that we can do specifically the one that we are looking for here is find and that will return all of the modules from the database so this fetches data from the database, just like the fetch request on the client side. Uh, but then it goes one step further, so it goes from the server to the database, which is also a server. And then it sends that those modules back to whatever um, client we have. So in this case, it's our React app coming back, but it could also be uh, Postman, for example, doing the same request. So we, here we can send and that's going to get that same data back here. So now Postman is our uh, client here. Um, cool, so that's the whole uh, process here. And this looks like a good point to actually make a commit. Um, again, we don't want to commit our .n file, so we're going to put that in um, right inf.local. Let's see, does it actually get picked up if we move .env uh, to .env.local? Does .env actually understand that file or not? Yeah? No. <laughs> yeah, so this is just indicating that there's nothing here um, that it's going to pick up. So it's kind of annoying. I thought that would be... What? No. Yeah, no. So we don't have to commit it. We don't have to have multiple ones like env.test. It doesn't make sense. Um, right, so we're going to go back to our git ignore here. And basically, we only want this. Ignore all of this. So we're not committing that. Uh, m file and actually we are going to move that again from env.local to env. And we're going to npm start just to sit, make sure that our server is still running. Seems like it does. And that works and it picks up the modules here, I hope. Yeah, there you are. Cool. So let's see so all of the changes we made was to our server we didn't actually change anything in, to our client which is kind of interesting because from the client side nothing has changed the data before came from memory and now it comes from a database but for the client it's just the same url so the client doesn't really care and this is really nice because if we want to switch databases or to switch to a different way of storing information for example from the server or do a caching layer or whatever for performance the client shouldn't know about that and shouldn't care about it. So you can also have two teams working, one on the server side and one on the client side. And they actually uh, can communicate through this uh, shared protocol, which is the API. So we can give add all of that. Um, let's check. And then we commit here. And then we say 
um, add or uh, work with live data using mongoose. Okay, we can push that to data to um, our GitHub uh, thing here. Cool. So we're going to run our server again. No, <laughs> in this folder. Um, that will run that here for us. And the next step that we we'll want to do is basically get our um, be able to to add a module here because we we can see modules and that's cool, but we can't actually add modules right now. And there's also no way to change them. So to add a module, we need a button. And then if we press that button, we want to see a form pop up that shows us our um, uh, all of the information we can fill in. And Michiel again has created this nice overview here. So this is our our pane, our modal pane that we want to see. It has these steps: first explanation, exercise, evaluation. Um, and we're going to build that sort of sort of in the same way as it's here. So we are, okay, let's add the button first. So we are going to close down this whole server thing. We are not touching the server right now. We're sort of putting up our client hat right now. So instead of thinking about the server side, we're only going to think about the client side here. So I'm going to close all of my tabs and I'm just going to look at these uh, modules uh, sorry, module list here. Um, so as I said before, it's going to have this button. But I already want to think about when this button will appear because I don't want to, it to appear all the time. This interface is useful when you're working with the app, when you're a normal user of the app. But the app module thing is only there for admins, so for people who can actually manage the application. So we probably in our state want to have a flag saying this is the admin or not. We still have to figure out how we get to that information. There's probably going to be some state in our application um, on the app level, so on the root level, that has an idea of logins. We don't know that about that yet. So right now we're just going to assume that we're admin anyway. And that allows us to um, have some extra admin stuff here. So we're going to have a like an uh, um, an admin thing. So here I'm going to ask for. Uh, so in our state, we're also going to ask for is admin, and then here we're going to say is admin, and um, we're going to this dot render admin uh, bar. So the admin bar is like an extra. Um, layer on top or an extra um, indication that has this uh, administrative stuff for us. And this is a function that we need to call here. So we need to write that function. Let's put it at the very end here, render admin bar. And the function for now will just um, return something. So it's going to return this uh, BAM like uh, thing, so it's admin bar and let's put something inside there just so, just so you can see so because we're admins we already want to see this admin bar right it should already appear on our screen right and there it is admin bar it's kind of in a weird spot but that's where it is um, why is it in a weird spot? I was expecting this bar to be um, at the bottom of the screen. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, right, yeah, because we rendered it before the module list. Okay, that makes sense. So we first render the app header, then we render this bar, and then we render the module list. That makes sense. So maybe well, this is actually a good spot to put it. So below our app header, if we're admin, we are going to have this extra row of functionality here, kind of like that. So we can go to our module list.css. 
Note that here it might not be the best um, place to put it. Because the admin bar is really its own thing, right? So it's kind of weird that it's going to be set in this location here. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking if I should do the right thing or just do the quick and dirty thing, but my, this is often <laughs> something that comes up. So just like we have the app header, we probably want to have our admin bar here as a module. So you notice that I'm doing the right thing. Maybe this is just because we're recording a video that <laughs> needs to do this. So, um, oops, import React from React. Oh yeah, let's save that first. So this is our admin bar.js, and that means that we also have an admin bar.css. And that will have the style for us. So we are importing that as well, admin bar.css. And so now we can do the less dirty thing here. I still want to have this admin bar thing here, but instead of rendering it like this, so this is my component right now. Um, so I'm going to make export default class class admin bar extends react component. We have a render method here and that's going to return our uh, admin bar here. Right? So right let's save that. And then here we are going to import that admin bar. So import um, admin bar from shared admin bar. So just like we had the app header, actually let's put it there. So just as we have our app header, we also have our admin bar here. So both are have the same thing here. Cool. Um, and then we change our render method here at the very end to actually render that admin bar. Now, it sort of looks weird because it needs some other, some extra properties, of course. It needs these buttons. Um, so we have to tell it, like, okay, what what are the things that need to appear on that admin bar? How do we figure that out? And the way I would do that is I want to be able to have a list of, let's call them actions. And an action, so there's a list of actions, and each action has a um, title. So what's the action going to be called, like add module? And then it will have the function that will execute when we call this action. So in this case, it's going to be this on add module, which we don't have yet. So these are our actions. We only have one action right now. And then our admin bar is going to have this list of actions here. So we want to have this on add module here. We're just going to log here on adding module. And this will actually need to show this modal. Um, cool. So our admin bar, uh, the reason why I do it this way and not just add the add module thing here, which I could do, is that our admin bar is just a location for certain actions to appear because, um, for example, if we're um, in a different screen, like the learning pod screen or the user screen, then our admin bar will have different actions. It will have like add user or delete user or um, I don't know what else, log in, log out. All of these things are part of the action actions, but they will be different for each admin bar. But this, the, the bar still has the same uh, location, it still has the same layout, for example. So let's quickly um, imagine how that's going to look. So these come in as props. So we have our actions here coming in as props here. Here it's probably a good idea to have our uh, props be validated. So we have our extra um, prop validation thing here at the bottom which I know I should write, but it's sort of like flossing, right? Once you're, you're in this flow, you don't really want to do that. So I leave these out for later and sort of do a cleanup stage where I actually add these things. Um, or sometimes I don't. 
Right, and then we are mapping over these things. So our action, uh, let's call them buttons, are going to be um, actions that map this dot render action, and these will appear here. Action buttons. So render action is going to take in an action, and an action again consists of a um, title and a um, handler and that's our action and it will return a button with an on click being set to handler so that's what happens if we click the button and this is the title of that button and we might have a class name where it says uh, admin bar underscore underscore button so we can style it okay fairly happy with that let's see if react is happy with that as well no it's not because we haven't saved this yet <clears throat> and you see it's also not happy with this one because here we haven't specified our um, map here so this this should also be called handler because we call it handler here I didn't have a name for it yet when I was uh, setting that up. Cool, so it has a button, it's called add module here. And now if we actually click it, yeah, it should also have a key, that's right. So now if you click it, we actually see this adding module, so it seems to work fine. Um, so our button here needs a key, and the key could be like the title, because the title is probably going to be unique. We don't have, we're not assuming that we have multiple buttons that do the same thing. Now we have to stop complaining about that. Cool. And now we can style it. So we can have our admin bar here. Um, we're going to need some padding. So starting from the top, we will need, let's say, 20 pixels. I'm not sure. 10 pixels to the side. Um, we have a background. It's going to look super formal. Uh, so 66. And the color is going to be 99. Even though we don't have a color, we don't actually use it right now. <clears throat> but the padding is kind of important. Okay, that's a bit too much. Um, that looks fancy. Um, maybe we can have like a border at the bottom of two pixels solid. And then, so the background was 666, so this would be like uh, 444. Cool. And then, maybe has one at the top as well that's a bit lighter so six, six, six. okay it's not really required <laughs> that's kind of fun um let's switch those around so it sort of looks like it's indented or something okay and then we have our admin bar button and the buttons are always pretty tricky to start because there's a lot of stuff that we have to do now, if you're using Bootstrap, and we probably should at some point in the future, then we have a lot of styling happens for you. But at the moment, we don't have that, so we have to do the styling ourselves. The most important part with the buttons is, as you can see, they have a very different look than the rest of the thing. Is to have to say that the background is inherited and the font is inherited as well. So it actually takes up the rest, the style that that's available for the rest of the page. And then the uh, the border here we actually do want a border um, we want the color also to be um, well not inherited we actually want to set the color and then we want to set the padding as well so at the top we want maybe three pixels and at the side we want five pixels that sort of gives us some button here yeah and then we have a border radius of four pixels maybe Okay, so that sort of looks like a button here. Um, cool. Still works. The outline is also a bit weird. Um, yeah, but now we don't actually get any feedback when we're clicking the button. Yeah, okay, so let's leave this outline in for here. We're not really concerned with the styling right now. Um, but we do have this nice uh, bar here, so I'm pretty happy with that. And now we have to focus on what happens if we add a module. 
So basically we have, we're going to have a form that's going to be displayed on top um, that will have the fields for us. So again, going back to preview, that's this form. And here it's important that um, we sort of store state in our module list where it knows that we are actually um, having this, this, this window open, this, that we're adding a module basically. So we are in our module list, just like we have an add, is admin, we'll probably have like um, is adding module. And that's the, the clue to us that it's a model that's open. Now by default this will be false, and then if we click the button it will be true. But as I'm developing, I just want this always to be true, so I can see the thing while it's open. I don't have to reopen it every time, right? And then in React, there is a package that we can use for models, which is React Model, um, and that will give us the modal dialog. So I know I have to install this, so I'm going to back to my client here. And we install React Model. While that's running, let's look at the documentation. Um, yeah, so we have a modal thing here. It's basically just something that's called modal. And then we put stuff in there. That's easy enough. So let's see if we can figure that out. So, so just as we had this render admin bar here, we're also going to do like is, uh, we have to add it here, here, is adding module. So is adding module and this render add module form which we don't have yet. So here, it's same thing, render at module form. Um, that's a function. And that will return our modal that will have this, all of this stuff inside, which you don't know yet. Um, the um, form itself I probably want to have in a different component but the modal I don't and it's maybe kind of confusing but I sort of like this is more about the how we're showing it and then the form itself is more what we show so I want the modal to be separate from the actual form um, I want the form to be able to to render by itself so I'm going to make a new form and that form will be uh, part of the model, so I will import that. Uh, right now, I just want to see like a uh, okay, model is open. Um, cool, and we have to use React model, of course. Let's put it here. Um, and there's another, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll cross that bridge if we get there. So we start the application again. We save our file. I'm going to look at our reacting here. That's going to start our development server. Then we'll take some time to compile because we have a new thing here. So it's going to be caching that stuff for us. And that will take some time. But um, once that's loaded, we should actually already see the model. Again, because we by default now we say is adding module true um, which will probably once we're done with this we're going to set that to false where it actually should be set to true we can now already add that is in add module right so this will say is adding module is true because this is the place where we're actually we're not adding the module we're just showing the model that's open cool so now you see that we our model is open, it works, and we have this background here, really nice. Um, it's saying app element is not defined, please use model.set app element. I'm not sure if I want this, so I'm just going to do this. And that will get rid of the warning. It's not ideal, but it works for now. Cool. 
right and now uh, for our form so in modules we also want to make a new file and this is going to be called our module form .js. Note that I don't call it the add form because it's the same or it could be the same form for adding or for editing. It's basically once it has the data, it doesn't really care if it's an add form or it's an edit form. Maybe the only thing that changes is the name on the button or something. But that's something that we can pass in from the props. So it's more about uh, storing what information needs to go into this uh, module form. So again, we are importing React from React. Uh, we're making our component here, so export default class module form extends react component I know I can copy and paste this, but I like typing that, sort of give me a clean slate here and I know that all of the fields that I have in this uh, thing will be stored here, right, so the title is going to be stored the um, um, what was the next one if I can find it here. Yeah, so the explanation is going to be stored. Right now that's empty. The exercise is going to be stored. And the evaluation is going to be stored. So that's our state. That's, that's the blank information. We're going to fill that in as we're doing on change events. So on render, we're going to get these things from the state. So I'm going to say, well, um, Get me, give me the title, give me the explanation, give me the exercise, give me the evaluation, and that comes from this dot state. And now we can actually render. So we are going to call this um, return uh, oops, diff. Uh, let's call it, let's do an actual form here because we can actually do that. And then that form um, will contain. Let's go back here. So the form will contain a header, and then it will contain um, some header, add module, header. It will also have this close button, but we'll do, um, come to that later. And that will have the module title. So let's do a really dirty one, and we'll clean that up later. So I want to have a label called module title. And I want a input field. The type is text. <coughs> and this this is the actual field. So this takes in the value from the title, and then on change it's going to do something. Now we can do this as a separate method, or um, we can do this just in line. So we can say, well, on change is going to get give an event. Um, that event something like this. And that event will have a method called um, e dot target dot value so that's the new value of our title and that we're going to use with this dot set state so this dot set state uh, title is e dot target dot value lots of brackets and sublime here nicely swallows one which is not uh, useful but that should have be enough for our form we're going to import that form here. Import module form from module form. And then we're going to render that form here. Right? So instead of this text calling it, saying module is open, we actually, oops, we want to see this. Um, yeah, we get some errors here in the, uh, the compiler saying explanation is assigned a value. That's true. We haven't used those yet. Still need to make fields for those. But it seems that it works. We can type something, and that will actually be our module title here, which is kind of nice. The formatting sort of looks super crappy. Um, so probably we should add a, a style to that as well. So we also are going to do module, oops, module form.css. And we probably should give that a class name, so module form. Um, by default, the module form itself probably doesn't do very much. Oh, 
not yet anyway um, but the uh, let's call it the header here that probably want to have like a font size of in pixels we have a bigger font here so let's add these uh, things here so here the class name this is kind of weird right so we want basically the top level should probably be a diff um, module form and then the header should be here and then the form should actually be the header I think mm, or maybe not okay it's basically splitting hairs it doesn't really matter I think and then this will be module form header and we will we'll normally see the header being a bit bigger no we don't because we don't import that here so we don't import module form CSS. now we do and note why this is super easy so that's the reason why i um leave this form open right because i refresh but then i automatically see so i don't even have to go to the browser to verify that it's working now for each of these um, form fields i actually want to make a div around that so I want to make something like um, div class name equals module form row. So this is like a form row, and a form row is basically all of these things together. Um, right, and then this will also have a class name module form label, and this will also have a class name saying module form text so to style these our module oops, module form row that's actually um, the reason why I need that is because I want to have a little bit of margin on that thing here and then especially if we're doing the next ones which we'll do in a minute and then the module form uh, label this is the important one because now you see it's next to here we actually want it to be display block so that it becomes its own thing and we also want to set to uh, call so to set the font size here uh, or let's what i really want is the text transform uppercase so i want to see these in uppercase letters which i kind of like and then i want the font size to be a bit smaller um, and then the header I also want to have like a margin bottom here of 20 pixels yeah cool and maybe this could be a bit bigger here yeah and then the styling for the uh, text field itself text fields are also tricky to style uh, there are a lot of things that go into it so maybe we can make it with already 100% um, that's better we can do the padding here so that's the, the thing inside of the field um, here, let's say 5 pixels at the top 10 pixels to the side um, that gives us a bit more room here uh, okay there's something still missing here so uh, you see that it sort of overflows here to the side and that's because we were using box sizing the wrong way so the box sizing here needs to be set to border box i think which fits it nicely so it's with 100 percent but that includes the padding whereas before it only includes the width of the actual content here so by default it's set to content box border box means it includes the sizing includes the size of the um, uh, padding and it includes the size of the border now I don't want to do this here, I actually want to do this for all of my components. So in index.css, that's our main styling here. I want to say well all of the components are going to be border box. And also here it makes sense to do this like a before and after if we're styling our components. But this is very useful because now our border box is applied everywhere. 
that could mean that it changes the styling a little bit of other components especially if we have the width um, used but right now it seems that everything looks kind of okay below that um, I want an outline here of none and then I want the whenever this thing is uh, focus I think it's called focus then I want the border to be on the border color to be like blue or something so here the border can be uh, like grayish and then if I click that right so now I'm in this focus state and now the border color is blue cool and then the label can maybe have a margin bottom of two pixels so it's a little bit below there yeah maybe a bit more four um, yeah and also here we want the font to be inherited so now we use a default font here instead of this uh, whatever font it's using right now cool um, except that I want the padding of the label to be the same as the padding of the actual text inside so you see that these nicely line up here um, it's kind of a small thing but really stands out if you're working with it um, cool so there's a lot of stuff for our title and it is um, but our title is really unique in that it's the only normal well, I should say not say normal but it's the only text field here the other ones are actually bigger right they're they're sort of strings in mongoose but if you look at the uh, preview here they actually take up a lot more space right they're actually filling this entire screen and I'm not going to do this this way right now or not yet I should say instead I'm just going to render them um, below each other I think for now um, so I'm going to make a new row and I'm just going to do one and then I'm going to extract that because I know I, I will be repeating myself here so it makes sense that I'm going to extract that but I need to know what to extract so this is going to be in my case it's called the first one which is called explanation right it's our field but it's not an input field it's a text area so this is like text area and the type is no longer relevant it's a text area the value is going to be the explanation and then if we change it this will be uh, explanation I think that does it right okay so it looks like crap um, that's because text areas we also need to style right so here text area the width of 100% they have a height that's going to be fixed like say 300 pixels um, it has this resize property which we want to set to none I think also we want to inherit the fonts we have our outline thing here our padding so a lot of these things are repeat but we can't really use the same thing here I think maybe we can for the for this thing here so we can say text area focus so the border is going to be shared between the two cool we can actually scroll this thing which is kind of nice but 300 pixels is a bit too much maybe 100 is enough cool so now we can type an explanation here and we can type our title here and make it save that's cool but this will be repeated over and over three times we already know that that's going to be the case so instead we're going to make a method render um, text area and what will that take in well it's going to take in the basically all the things that have the word explanation here so it's going to take in the title it's going to take in the uh, value and it's going to be taking the thing it needs to change in uh, the state so let's call that the key or something and I'm going to reorder these so we have a property this is our key basically so what what is the thing that we want to change we have 
the property has a title and it has a value. These three things are important. Um, and the names, that those are the ones that I choose. They might be different in your case. So you might think of different names, which is fine. Um, so we cut this out. And now we just say render text area um, with these three properties. So the first one is explanation. Then the um, title, which is also explanation with an uppercase. And then the value is going to be explanation, like this. And then we have to change them here as well. So this is a title, like this. This is the value, which is now just called value. And this is the weird one, right? This is the one that has square brackets around because we can't really type property here because then we set a state with the actual key called property. Instead, we want the one that's inside there. So the value that is inside of property, that will be the name of this uh, key that we're setting on set state. Does this actually work? That's the question. The answer is no. Um, because we have to use this dot render text area. And note that I'm also using this other syntax here instead of the normal function syntax, <clears throat> just to make sure that I can use this in my keywords uh, inside of here. So this looks good. Um, cool. And now to have the other ones, we just have to copy these. So the next one is called exercise. Uh, that's a exercise thing, and that's exercise. It's just three times the same thing, right? And the last one is evaluation. And this one is also an evaluation. So we have some repetition here, which is fine. We don't really mind. Um, but we really uh, want this to happen, right? Our three fields here. And now we only have to specify the ones, which is cool. We could also do this for render text, and that makes sense. But I only have one of those. So I don't really care that, that this code is here. It has to be somewhere. And as long as there is no du duplication, then I'm fine with this just being here. It would make sense to sort of start factoring this out, but I often find if I do this now and I keep changing things, then I have to come back to this form anyway at some point because maybe I have a different structure or maybe I use a different component that's available from React, and then it still has to go there. So I don't do these refactorings. They're not really useful. Um, and then the last part is adding the button. So that will also happen in a row. Um, the only thing here is maybe we want to have um, module form where it says like uh, or, uh, actions or something because that's our, our specific our, our button row, right? We go back to our preview. There's two buttons here. There's cancel and there's an add module. So that's cool. We want these to be here as well. So we have a button. Um, class name equals module form button. And if we click that button, this is going to be our oops. Uh, this uh, on cancel. So that's me called cancel. And then we have a second one. Um, that's also a button. And that's going to be called this on add module. Note that here we don't really call it on add module, we're going to call it on submit. Because this same form is going to be used in um, when we're editing these things, and then it doesn't make sense that this is called add module. Um, so right now it's called uh, add module here, but probably at some point this will be. Um, a prop that we set where it says okay what's the name of this what's the submit action name or something from for this form so right now I'm hard coding this um, but I probably want to change that at some point right and we're going to save that see if we actually see the buttons and cool they're here um, so we can style them. 
So module form actions, we want to use display flex here and have a flex direction of uh, row and oh sorry uh, yeah row reverse no row and then justify content is uh, flex end so they're at the end of the of the line here yeah there you are and then the button then sells and here I probably want to have like a generic button style because I've already done buttons before for the admin thing here so these buttons um, they probably can be sort of similar to the other buttons here except that these ones go on the back dark black background and the other ones don't okay let's not worry about that too much for now so I'm just going to copy and paste this because here the color is different and that's why I don't want to start wasting my time with figuring out how to style them. Um, and buttons, as you can see, they, they're sort of next to each other, right next to each other. So they want to have a little bit of margin. But I don't want the last one to have a margin here. So a good way to do that maybe is to have a margin to left and right of, let's say, 10 pixels. That will space them out. It should space them out. Yeah, there they are. Um, but then the last one I know, so for the module form button, last child, that has a margin to the right of zero. So it doesn't have a margin there. Cool. And then it's nicely aligned here. Cool. So I can press these buttons, they don't do anything. Um, in fact, they actually do something because they're stored inside of a form. The form is actually submitted if I press this button. Yeah, so we have to prevent that. And we can do that through a method called unprevent. <laughs> so our cancel thing here takes an event. And the first thing we have to do is prevent default here. So we have to say like, okay, don't, don't do the thing that you were supposed to do or were going to do. And the same we do for our unsubmit. We're also going to prevent that action from happening. It's complaining. No? Yeah. So now we can keep pressing these buttons and, and nothing happens, which is fine. Um, and what these buttons actually need to do, we don't know. This is up to the props, so we have to call this up props uh, on cancel. And we let that prop figure it out. Same for unsubmit. The thing we want to do with unsubmit though is we actually want to pass in the uh, data. So for uncancel we don't because we are we're basically throwing away everything that was inside here. But for unsubmit we actually want the data, right? Because that's why we're here. That's why we, we filled in this form. So we want to have the title, we have the explanation, we have the exercise and we have the evaluation. Cool. Um, Okay, and they, those come, of course, from the state. So, like this. This, this it doesn't really matter. Okay, so our component needs these things now, because if now I click the button, it's going to complain saying there is no on submit. That's not a function, it's undefined. So going back to our module list, here in module form we have to specify these two actions, right? So and on cancel, <coughs> what will that do? Well, it's probably going to do um, this dot set state um, is adding module false, same as we had here, right? But then false. And on submit, that will actually do something. So this will do like uh, this dot add module with all the information we get back here. So we get back a module. Let me say this that add module with the module. That's our unsubmit action. So we have to make this add module function that takes in a module. And right now just that's the law of the module here. 
even small steps just to show um, what's actually going on here. That's kind of weird. Um, yeah. That's a function now. This is not a function, right? So this it needs to be a function. So right now it's something that we immediately do while we're rendering, we're actually calling that. This is not what we want. Instead we want this to be a function. So it's sort of holding this this information here. Cool, so you can now type tests. One on one, two to two, two to three. The interface is super crappy, but it seems that we get this information from the module and if we press cancel, this thing disappears. Cool. And if we press add module again, we see it again. And it's empty, which is what we want. Very nice. Okay. Also, when we're adding a module, um, the module should, should disappear as well, right? Because we've added it. So we probably want to do something else here as well, because our, our modules is going to be updated based on the information we get back from the store, um, which we'll do in a minute. But then we also want to hide this, um, this form, because we're now done with it. Okay, so if we now type something, we will see that we are adding module and then it closes, so it's saved now. So what we do here, well, we're going to say module store dot add module, or let's call it create module. Mm, we probably should call it create module here as well, right? Yeah, not sure about that. Um, and that's going to pass in the module. Now this is an async thing, so that means that this is an async thing. So we have to write uh, async here. We are waiting for that module store to come back and that will give us this new module. And the difference between the module that we pass in and the module that we get back is that this new module will have the ID. That's the one we get back from um, MongoDB. Or we will once we create the backend for that. So, our state then is the is adding module, but it will also have the new modules, right? So the modules here is going to be the old modules plus the new one. And we can do that if this becomes a function, right? If this is like um, the old state or just state. Does this work yeah it works if we do it this way um, the brackets are kind of confusing but if we do it this way we have to type return because these brackets indicate that it's a, an action that we want to take it's a piece of code that we want to run and it's up to us to return something if we use these round brackets that means that whatever is inside these round brackets like five is the thing that gets returned in our case, it needs to be set state, so it needs to contain these brackets to indicate, okay, this is the thing you get back. So get back the old state, now it's your responsibility to give me back the new state. And then we close that one down here as well. So what goes inside here? Well, these things, right? So the modules is going to be the old modules with these dot, dot, dot. So it sort of expands that out, it splices that out into this array. And then it's also going to add this new module at the end. Right. And then it's adding module is false. Cool. Does this work? No, because our module store is not there. <clears throat> we don't have that yet. So it's going to complain that our module store is not there. So let's add that here. So we already had our get modules here. Now we need... Why am I copying this? Now we need create module. And that's also going to fetch um, the API URL slash modules. But then instead of um, fetching, so using the get method, it's going to do a post method. And we have to do the backend code for that as well. Right? Um, 
but let's cheese it for now let's fake it for now so, so let's imagine that we get this module back and then we return it we're going to add a random ID here um, like one two three four five and then we return that module so this sort of pretends that this thing is working and this is a nice in between we only do the thing that we really need now of course it doesn't save anything but at least we expect this module to appear at the very end of our list right so if we add a new module here we say well this is module foo and it has like some, st some stuff in it um, now if we press add module we actually expect this module to be here and it is so we now can do except 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 and save our Google results. And now we get into our module. Right? That's the explanation, that's the exercise, that's the evaluation. Really cool. Except that we don't store anything. So how do we do a post request? Well, let's find out because we're going to ask Stack Overflow as we always do. So we fetch that. The most important thing here is that our um, Yeah. Uh, so that we have this extra arguments basically and there we set our method to be post and our body so whatever comes in is going to be stringified with the module so that's going to be the data from the module but then stored as JSON and we wait for that response to come back now we want this response to be JSON right so our new module here new module is going to be uh, the, J the JSON of that data. And sometimes I also add an extra layer here, which is that it's not really the module that comes back, it's the status of the thing. But we have a status code here, and that will also tell us enough. So if that's 200, then actually that should be enough for us to figure that out. Okay, so we post here, we have the body. We might do header set to application JSON, but I'm not really sure if we need that, so we're going to skip that for now. See if we can get away with it, just doing this way. Um, so we can save that. But of course, if we do this on server, we will not actually have something working, because now this will just fail, right? So we do this, we do add module, and we see that it has a post request saying, <coughs> um, 404 not found. So posting to modules slash modules is not available. It's not an action that we can take. So now we have to switch heads and go back to our server side to actually make that happen. So let's go to index.js. This is the server side. So app.get modules. This is our get request. We also want to have app.post to modules and that will do create module, right? That's our controller figuring that thing out. Now this will crash probably, because create module doesn't exist. Um, so we'll look at our controller, and that makes sense, it's not here. So we need to actually do that. So do create module. That takes in request and response, and it's up to us to um, get that request but the nice thing about this is request of body is already a JSON thing so already um, we get something back from the server that's that's correct that works and I'll show you that if I log this thing um, and then we probably should make the module um, so it's like a new module uh, with the information from requested body. Again, remember that the requested body is actually our the data that we have for our module, right? It's our module data. So we can actually, it just makes more sense. We can say like uh, module data equals requested body. It sort of makes clear what we're passing in here. Uh, but it's just the same thing. And then that has a mo new module. The cool thing about that is this new module here um, is uh, has the MongoDB ID, I think. Not really sure, so let's try saving that. We should probably figure that out from the documentation. So, what does save give back? This is a really basic 
question to have. But yeah. Um, yeah, so it does it does give us back this thing here, which is a new one. Okay, cool. So that should probably work. And then we can send along this new module like this. Saying, okay, we're we're done here. This looks pretty clean. Almost too clean. And now it makes sense to try that out in Postman first. So we can go to modules here, add a new request saying create module. Save that. And we have to be very careful here because this is not automatically selected. So we have to click this. Then we have to say, well, we post here to localhost modules with a post request. And then our body is going to be uh, raw JSON data. And that will have basically the title here saying uh, my title. It's going to be, and I'm going to cheat a little bit here by saying, okay, let's uh, do this load dummy data here. It's going to have an explanation here. Um, my explanation. It's going to have a exercise. My exercise and evaluation. my evaluation beautiful uh, you see that if I add this comma here it's not allowed it, in JavaScript it is but not in JSON so now I can save this and send it and yeah that doesn't work so let's look at our server it's still waiting for file changes that's kind of weird because we have these file changes here right because we have to have the root one. Okay. Route of post requires a callback function. Okay, I know what it is. So this looks good, but in controller we also need to export that. It's kind of stupid that this thing doesn't say, well, you, you passed in this create module, but it's undefined. Um, so or I can't find it, but it just says, yeah, this is not a function. Often that means that the, the thing you had is undefined so this this needs to be exported from the module exports right and now we can send it it gives us nothing back awesome um why not is that because of the save thing does it actually store it though so let's go to mongo use hobo app db modules not fine it's there though so we have our data here the only problem is that it's not actually giving us anything back so um, we do want the data from the thing to get back but we have to wait here so that's the problem we have to do a wait here um, to actually get the data back because this is async of course so now if we send it, cool, so now we get the actual data back. And this is the post request that we want. So I'm going to save this. I have some ec extra stuff in my database here that will also show up normally if I refresh the page. Yeah, I still have this view here, so if I cancel. Uh, okay, but you see this, these extra two are now added, so which is what I want. And now if I add another module here, foo, Blah, 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 that module, uh, almost. So we see that it's, it created the module. It knows that there's a new module here, but it doesn't fill it in with anything. Now if we refresh, and again, we close this down. Hmm. We didn't send anything here. Okay, so this is a good place to look at our network thing here. Figure out what gets sent along. So, uh, test one, um, that module. 
wait, what? It's here now. The, the request payload actually shows us this data. So let's take a look. But here it shows up as empty, which is kind of weird. Do we need to maybe set the headers? Yeah, so we send it as text plane. That's probably not a good idea. So maybe we do need the headers here. Um, now we get to a confusing part, so where do we add these headers? And uh, You have to take a step back, it's the client that's actually the problem. So the server is correct, and we know that this, it's correct because we can send this here in Postman and that works, but it's the client that has a problem with this. So we go to module store, this is where we actually make the request, and now we add these headers that we just found out from Stack Overflow. So the content type actually like to put them in this order because the content type is the thing that we send along and the accept is saying okay this is what we get back this is what, what we expect to get back now accept already we know that we are accepting the right thing but the content type application JSON that that we didn't have before before it was set to um, text which means that we are only sending text along and uh, Node.js doesn't do any Thing with that information it doesn't parse it into JSON and so the JSON we get back is basically an empty thing and that of course we can't if we save it then the module title and all of that will just be empty I'm going to call this test 2 let's add our module here and now we actually see it which is cool so that module is there and we show it and um, let's also look at the other fields here so, um, right, so all of them are closed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say that all of the modules right now are active. And that means that they will all be um, expanded. So we can all see all of the modules, all the data from all of the modules. Um, right, and let's also hide this app model here, adding model here. So we need to press the button. Okay, cool. So now we see all of these. They're all set to the same step. The last one, we didn't have any information for that. So we're going to add our module. And now we're actually going to type some more stuff. So um, um, test tree, explanation, information. This is your exercise migration. Um, just check Add module. Now if we go to the button, it says explanation information, we can press next step. This is your exercise, evaluation, just checking. Cool. So it seems that it works. We did the whole round trip thing, and we actually get the data back. So in our um, modules, Rosalina, you doing it? You doing it? You got to hear it. Give me five minutes, I'm going to be ready. We are going to do a post request which is here um, this will have the information here our response that we get back is this one so it has the ID has all of this information and that gets added to the other module here which is this one all right so we take in the, the existing modules that we have and we add the new modules here and if we refresh um, that will load all of them from the database here and that works now our thing is kind of messy but remember we had this um, load dummy data script which sort of scrubs our data base and adds the clean ones so now if we start the server um, we weren't fast enough here let's refresh ah, now the spinner is working cool and it's still spinning. Okay. Cool. So now you see that we have our basic data back again. Cool. So a couple of things we changed here. Um, the true 
where we have these is active check so we need to get rid of that one our form is fine so it's not added immediately so that looks good um, it's still a bit messy but we'll do lay out the next step and that looks really good so we can commit that so we are going to basically use this tab check it um, so we changed a lot of stuff in oh yeah and this is the reason why I do this because I want to remove my console logs here um, so in the server are we just in the server what is this only server stuff that's kind of weird Where's my, this is no, no. Um, okay. Why isn't it adding? An unpopulated sub module client. What the? What? Hmm, this sucks. Are we actually doing anything weird? I don't know. Um, we can actually add those files, but I also want to have the client files, of course. So, why? Am I not seeing those? Seems like you removed the git folder. Well, not really. It's here. Um, okay, I'll figure that out off screen because I really need to get to bed. But that's basically um, where we are now. So we can now add modules and that works really well. So I'm super happy with that. Hope you are too. So. See you next time.